Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the awesome privilege of living in a land where we can open your word freely and hear your voice and implement your counsel into our lives. And Father, we ask that as we open that word, that your Holy Spirit will be present here and open minds and hearts to receive the seed of truth. And Father, I thank you for hearing and for answering my prayer. For I ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In our study today, we are going to look at the prophetic dimension of Matthew chapter 24, particularly up to verse 17. Now, if you remember, in our last study, we did a historical study of this same passage. We showed how all of these verses were fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem, the second destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. But you remember that this uh, particular story has a twofold application. It was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem, but it's going to be fulfilled again in conjunction with the final destruction of the world. And we know this because two questions were asked by the disciples. They said, when will these things be? In other words, when will uh, not one stone be left upon another on the temple? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? So two questions led Jesus to provide one mingled answer. In other words, Jesus blended what was going to happen in the destruction of Jerusalem with what is going to take place in the final destruction of the world. Now, I would like to review the sequence of events that we studied last time, and I'm going to go through this quickly. We're not going to read verses or dwell on these things because we studied them in our last lecture. You remember that first of all, Jesus mentions false Christs rising and deceiving many. Then he mentions several disasters. He mentions famines, and he mentions persecution and he mentions earthquakes, and he mentions diseases, pestilence, wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And we noticed in our last study that Satan has an agenda behind all of these things. The agenda is ultimately to blame God's people for what was happening. Because Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9, immediately after talking about the wars and rumors of wars and all of these disasters tells us then they will seek you out and persecute you. Then we notice that as a result of persecution God's people would be led to stand before magistrates and kings to give a witness for their faith. And we notice that when they went before magistrates and councils that God was going to give them a powerful message to speak and the Holy Spirit was going to give them words to speak when they appeared before these great men of the earth. Then we notice that as a result of the persecution that the love of many would grow cold and many would be offended at Jesus. And we notice that Jesus predicted that fathers would rise against their children and mothers against their children and brothers against their sisters and friends against friends would persecute one another. In other words, certain family members would apostatize from the faith and they would become enemies of their own families. We notice also that in this context false prophets were going to arise in the midst of Jerusalem. We notice, therefore, that God's people needed a special endurance or a special patience so that they would not be deceived by Satan's signs, so that they would not give up when they were persecuted, so that their love would not wax cold or become cold. They needed endurance. And then we noticed that the gospel would be preached to the whole world, and then Jesus said that the end would come. But before the end, he spoke of the abomination of desolation that would take place and the tribulation 
that would occur before his coming and we noticed last time that the abomination of desolation the abomination itself was uh, the Roman standards that had the eagle and the sunburst and the eagle was facing right and had arrows in its talons and they put these in the ground, the Roman armies did, and they bowed down and they worshiped them. They were worshiping the sun god represented by the eagle and by the golden wreath which was a symbol of the sun. And we notice that when this sign was seen, God's people saw the sign and when the Roman armies retreated, God's people fled from the city of Jerusalem and those who did not see the sign remained in the city and then the Romans came and you had the destruction of the city, in other words, desolation. So this is the abomination of desolation. And then Jesus speaks about his people fleeing to the mountains because persecution is going to take place. And he says that the worst period of tribulation in the history of the world was going to come up till that time. And when we read the description about the terrible trials of the city of Jerusalem, how parents, believe it or not, would eat their children, how they would kill one another, how there were earthquakes and famines and diseases, certainly this was a terrible period of tribulation, but God's people fled and they were spared the destruction. Now this in a nutshell is the sequence of events that we studied last time. Today we are going to study the end time application of this prophecy we're going to notice the same sequence of events but we're going to notice that they're going to be fulfilled in the end time instead of with literal Jerusalem they are going to be fulfilled with spiritual Jerusalem which is the church and instead of these things being fulfilled with literal Israel in a small location such as Jerusalem, these things are going to be fulfilled on a worldwide scale with spiritual Israel all over the world. Now I want to tell you that I'm going to read several statements from the writings of Ellen White. Ellen White, uh, interestingly enough, presents all of these things in their proper order and she describes the same thing happening in the end time as happened in conjunction with the destruction of Jerusalem. I don't think that she consciously did this. She didn't sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write everything about what happened in Jerusalem and how it's parallel to the end time. But when you read her writings, you gather that she comments on all of these things in the same chronological sequence as they appear in the destruction of Jerusalem. So I'm going to read several statements from her writings, many of them from the book Desire of Ages, others from the book Great Controversy, and a few from other sources. I'd like to first of all read a statement about false Christs. You remember that we read from Josephus that many false Christs arose, many false messiahs. In the book The Desire of Ages, page 631, Ellen White states this, False prophets did rise deceiving the people and leading great numbers into the desert. Magicians and sorcerers claiming miraculous power drew the people after them into the mountain solitudes. And then she states this, but this prophecy was spoken also for the last days. All you have to do is look out at the world in the last 20 years and you'll see many individuals who have arisen and claimed to be the Christ. You know I don't have to amplify this point. You have for example David Koresh who called himself the sinful Messiah. We have also before that Jim Jones. You know his story. 900 people in his cult committed suicide. And more recently Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. Maybe you haven't heard of him. He's a fellow from Puerto Rico and uh, he claims to be Christ on earth. He claims that sin doesn't exist. And by the way, lately he's told all of his members to wear t-shirts with the number 666. That's very, very interesting. And yet he claims to be the Christ. So many false Christs have risen, particularly in the last 20 years. Now what about wars, pestilence, earthquakes, and hunger? I want to read a couple of statements once again from Ellen White and we don't actually even have to read from Ellen White because you know what's been happening you know you have Katrina you have the tsunami 
uh, you have several humongous earthquakes that have taken place in the last 10 years but allow me to read you from the book Last Day Events page 24 in the last scenes of this of this earth's history war will rage there will be pestilence plague and famine the waters of the deep will overflow their boundaries that's interesting in the light of Katrina property and life will be destroyed by fire and by flood in the book The Great Controversy which is a phenomenal book everybody needs to read this book because it describes the history of uh, Christianity from the destruction of Jerusalem all the way till the end of the millennium we find this significant statement speaking about the devil she says it is his object to incite the nations to war against one another for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God while appearing to the son to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies Satan will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation we saw that with New Orleans but it's going to happen more and more frequently she continues saying, even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land in great conflagrations, that means wars in fierce tornadoes oh. tornadoes, have you heard about that recently? in the midwest of the United States and terrific hailstorms in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes in every place and in a thousand forms Satan is exercising his power he sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow he imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousands perished by pestilence these visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous and then immediately after this statement she says basically the same thing that Jesus said after he speaks about the disasters he says then they will seek you out and they will persecute you and they will kill you notice the very next sentence that she mentions Great Controversy page 590 and then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils that's exactly what Matthew 24 is describing she continues saying, the class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors and then she says that God's people are going to have to stand before magistrates and kings to give witness for their faith in the midst of persecution notice this statement in Testimonies for the Church volume 6 page 128 and 129 she's speaking to us in the last days we shall have to stand before magistrates to answer for our allegiance to the law of God to make known the reasons of our faith and the youth should understand these things in the book Fundamentals of Christian Education page 217 she says this, many will have to stand in the legislative courts some will have to stand before kings and before the learned of the earth to answer for their faith those who have only a superficial understanding of truth will not be able clearly to expound the scriptures and give definite reasons for their faith however she says that when God's people appear before these great leaders of the world the Holy Spirit is going to give his people wisdom to speak this is what the Bible calls the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God it's called the loud cry in the book of Revelation notice in the book manuscript releases volume 8 page 187 what she says about the moment when God's people will have to appear before the magistrates of the world she says this those who receive Christ as personal savior will stand the test of trial in these last days 
the Lord Jesus will give the disciples a tongue and wisdom, notice he's quoting almost Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus will give the disciples a tongue and wisdom that their adversaries can neither gainsay nor resist, those are the exact words from the Gospel of Luke, those who could not by reasoning overcome satanic delusions will bear an affirmative testimony that will baffle supposedly learned men. Imagine that, God's people appearing before the great men of the world and baffling them with their arguments. That's exactly what the disciples did when they were persecuted. She continues saying, words will come from the lips of the unlearned with such convincing power and wisdom that conversions will be made to the truth thousands will be converted under their testimony interesting that she's following the same sequence of events that we have in Matthew chapter 24 but instead of being just a handful of Christians in the literal city of Jerusalem she's talking about the church of God the remnant church on a worldwide scale that is proclaiming God's message to the world by the way, do you remember that when they appeared before magistrates and kings and persecution came that according to Matthew 24 many were going to be offended in their connection with Jesus and they were going to forsake their walk with the Lord? That's what Matthew chapter 24 says. Now notice this statement from the Great Controversy, page 608. As the storm approaches a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition what are they going to do? abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. Is that said in Matthew chapter 24? It most certainly is. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, see once again the idea of being brought before courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Now what about friends and family turning against their friends and their family? Notice this interesting statement in last day events pages 150 and 151. Friends will prove themselves will prove themselves treacherous and will betray us. Relatives deceived by the enemy will think they do God's service in opposing us and putting forth the utmost effort, efforts to bring us into hard places hoping we will deny our faith. And in the book Prophets and Kings page 588 we find these words, those who are true to God will be menaced, denounced, proscribed. They will be, be, and now she quotes, they will be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends, even unto death. Luke chapter 21 and verse 16. You see there's nothing new under the sun. Matthew chapter 24 makes it very clear that this chapter has a double application. It applies to the events that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem, but it also applies to the events that will lead up to the final destruction of the world. And what happened with Jerusalem during the period of the Roman siege becomes a symbol of what is going to happen at the end of time when the world is suffocated by false doctrine and by satanic deceptions and by terrible persecutions. Now you remember that in Matthew chapter 24 it said that because of the increase of iniquity the love of many would grow cold? Interesting. It must mean that at one time they loved the Lord, right? If their love is going to grow cold they must have had hot love before. Now notice this statement from last day events page 173. There will be a shaking of the sieve. 
the chaff must in time be separated from the wheat. Because iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold. It is the very time when the genuine will be the strongest. And in another very significant statement in the devotional book, Lift Him Up, page 310, we find these words. The Lord Jesus on the Mount of Olives, notice he's going back to Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus on the Mount of Olives plainly stated that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Who is Jesus talking about when he says, the love of many will wax cold? Is he talking about the worldlings, or is he talking about professed Christians? Notice what she continues saying. He, that is Jesus, speaks of a class who have fallen from a high state of spirituality. So did they have a high state of spirituality? Yes. She says, he speaks of a class who have fallen from a high state of spirituality. Let such utterances as these come home with solemn searching power to our hearts. Where is the fervor, she asks, the devotion to God that corresponds to the greatness of the truth which we claim to believe? The love of the world, the love of some darling sin, has weaned the heart from the love of prayer and of meditation on sacred things. A formal round of religious services is kept up, but where is the love of Jesus? She says, spirituality is dying. Do you think she's describing pretty accurately what's happening in the Christian world today? You know, you look at the divorce rate in the Christian world, it's practically identical to what it is uh, in the church. You look at the problem of pornography, it's just as much a problem in the church as it is outside the church. You look for uh, the issue of entertainment. Christians entertain themselves with the th same things that the world entertains themselves with. And yet, you know, people go to church, they continue their round of ceremonies, but they, they look like they're alive, to use the words of Revelation, but they're actually dead in their spiritual experience. Now you remember that in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says you're going to need patience when all of these things came, come. In fact, he says we need patience for three reasons. Number one, because of the deceptions of Satan. Number two, because of the persecution. And number three, because there's a tendency for the love to wax cold. So Jesus says you need to have patience. And by the way, the word patience there should better be translated endurance. It's that Greek word hupomone. It, it's the different than the word that is translated long-suffering in the King James Version. It's referring uh, rather to, to being perseverant in the face of tremendous trials. And then you'll notice that Jesus speaks about a final preaching of the gospel. And I want you to notice three elements that Jesus mentions when he speaks about the gospel going to all of the world back then. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Now notice, you have a gospel. It's going to be preached where? In all the world, as a witness to all nations, and then what? And then the end will come. I want you to notice three elements here. The gospel preached to all nations, and then the end comes. Does the book of Revelation have something very similar to this in the end time? Notice Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting what? Same word, the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Is that the same thing that we found in Matthew, that it's going to go to all of the world? Yes, but now I want you to notice that in Revelation you have something that explains what this gospel is. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and now notice, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. What does this gospel call people to do? It calls people to fear God, to give glory to God, because we're in the judgment, and to worship the what? 
to worship the Creator. Now let me ask you, what is the sign of the Creator according to Scripture? According to the Bible, God established a sign at the very beginning to remind us of the Creator, and that sign was His Holy Sabbath. So when the Gospel is preached to the whole world, it's preached in the context of bring on, bringing honor to the Creator by keeping His Holy Sabbath in honor of Him. And then if you continue reading the three angels' messages, later on you find Jesus sitting on a cloud, and He has a sickle in His hand, and He's returning to the earth. The end has come when the three angels' messages are proclaimed to the world. I want to read a statement that we find in Desire of Ages, page 633. In the prophecy of Jerusalem's destruction, Christ said, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. She's quoting Matthew 24, and then she says this, This prophecy will again be fulfilled. The abounding iniquity of that day finds its counterpart in this generation. So, with the prediction in regard to the preaching of the gospel, before the fall of Jerusalem, Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, declared that the gospel was preached to every creature which is under heaven. So, now, she says, before the coming of the Son of Man, the everlasting gospel is to pre be preached to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. So let me ask you, is the sequence of events in the end time going to be the same as the sequence event of events that led to the destruction of Jerusalem? Absolutely. It is like a carbon copy, except that in the end time these things are going to be fulfilled not in a little region of the Middle East, but they're going to be fulfilled on a worldwide scale. They're not going to be fulfilled with literal Israel, who claim to be God's people, but they're going to be fulfilled with the Christian church on a global scale. Now we need to dedicate the rest of our time together to talk about the abomination of desolation in prophecy. Now let me review what the abomination was before the destruction of Jerusalem. You remember that the Roman standards had an eagle. The eagle was facing right, there was a golden wreath around the eagle representing the sun and when the Roman armies came they put these standards in the ground and they worshiped their standards in this case they were worshiping the sun god Mithra now you say how in the world could this be fulfilled in the end time I'm going to share with you some very remarkable things now about the United States of America I don't know if you have a one dollar bill, but if you have a one dollar bill you can take it out and I am going to review some very interesting things that we find on our one dollar bill. Uh, I don't know whether you've taken the time to really take a look at what we have on the obverse and on the reverse side. And by the way, after all of you have your one dollar bill out, we'll call the deacons forward and we'll pick up an offering. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a way for me to trick you into getting an offering tonight. No, I'm just kidding. Now, I want you to notice uh, the one dollar bill, if you have one, you're going to understand a lot better what I'm going to talk about. Allow me to say something about the, what is on the obverse side, or the front side, of what is known as the Great Seal of the United States. Before we look at the specific symbols that we have on the one dollar bill, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of how this seal came into existence. By the way, the two circles are the front side and the back side of the Great Seal. The Great Seal, or the state of arms of the United States, is the official emblem of our country. It is placed on all judicial, legislative, and executive proclamations. It certifies and authenticates all official acts of the United States government. And it is to be found as an official seal on all of the laws and statutes of the United States. Now this seal was created very early in the history of our republic. In fact, on July 4, 1776, the very day of the Declaration of Independence, a committee of three men got together to 
uh, decide what seal to create representing the authority of the United States. The committee was composed of Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. And of course, uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin being the loving guy that he was, he wanted a turkey to represent the United States. I'm glad that uh, the others didn't listen to him. But anyway, after this first meeting, everything was tabled. They didn't make a decision. After three additional committee meetings, finally the seal that we have on our one dollar bill was adopted on June 28, 1872. So this seal is not a recent innovation. It goes back to the very roots of the history of the United States. Now let's take a look at what the obverse side of the seal contains. The obverse side means the front side. You'll notice that the front side has an eagle, right? Which direction is the eagle facing? He's facing right. How are his wings? They are outstretched. What is above the head of the eagle? A sunburst. The sun breaking through the clouds. And what does the eagle have in his talon? Arrows. Now does this sound very similar to the eagles of Rome? It's almost identical to the eagles of Rome. Now you say, why would the United States adopt the eagle and the sunburst as its symbol? Very significant that it's a sunburst, an eagle and a sunburst. And by the way, in the Bible the eagle and the sun are very closely related, even in the Bible. In Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 it speaks about the sun of righteousness rising with healing in its what? with healing in its wings. Notice the words of Whitney Smith who is an expert on flags, on world flags, what he says about the eagle and the sun as an emblem. He says, in a large number of lands the sun is associated not so much with independence but with the promises it brings in the dawn of a new day. It's interesting that after the Constitutional Convention in 1787 uh, a special uh, chair was prepared for George Washington to sit in uh, there and you can actually see the chair it's called the rising sun chair and on the backrest at the very top you have this sun and you don't really know whether it's rising or whether it's setting. Benjamin Franklin who was present there said this as he looked at this sun he said I have often looked at that sun behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting. But now at length I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. Because the Constitutional Convention had been successful, he says, there's nothing but peace and prosperity ahead for this new nation. Interesting that Ellen White in the book Great Controversy page 588 and 589 says that in the end time the religious world will believe that by the imposition of the day of the sun this will bring a new day of peace and prosperity to the world. Some people might say, well Pastor Barb, but that's a coincidence, that's a stretch to say that the seal, the great seal of the United States is related to, to the standards of, of the Romans. How can you make that connection? Well, the fact is that it's not coincidental. Even though Rome and the United States are separated in time, in culture, in language, and in religion, we know for a fact that there is a definite connection between the Roman standard and the great seal of the United States. And we know this for three reasons. Number one, we already noticed that Matthew 24 has a twofold application. It applies to the Roman standards when Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, and it must have also an end time application. Secondly, we're going to notice that the United States itself says that it got this symbol from Rome. And finally, we're going to notice that Ellen White confirms what we find from the testimony of the United States itself and from the testimony of Matthew chapter 24 that this emblem that the United States adopted, she borrowed directly from Rome. Allow me to read you a statement from, from uh, Whitney Smith, who is an expert on world flags. In fact, he wrote in his book, 
flags through the ages and across the world, page 314, this is what he says, the neoclassical spirit of America at the end of the 18th century looked to the ancient Roman Republic for many symbols. What did the United States do? It looked to the ancient Roman Republic for many symbols, including the name, the name of the upper chamber of Congress, which by the way is the Senate. Where does that name come from? Rome. He continues saying, in Rome the eagle began as a republican symbol. Hence, Americans chose their native bald eagle for the national arms in 1782. What Whitney Smith is saying is that uh, the founders of this country, when they established this seal, they were directly borrowing from the eagle that was on the standards that the Roman legions had. Now let's take a look at the reverse side of the great seal. That's the other circle that you have on the one dollar bill. You'll notice that on the other side you have what is called a sycorat. A sycorat is an unfinished pyramid. And above the pyramid you have what is called the eye of providence. And what is circling the eyes of providence? The eye of providence. It is actually the rays of what? the rays of the sun. And by the way you'll notice that the pyramid has 13 strata. 13 is a very significant number in the world of the occult. In fact it's a Masonic symbol. And the idea of the unfinished pyramid is the idea, you know, the, the Freemasons begin actually uh, in the times of Solomon. They claim to uh, come into existence at the time of Solomon when Solomon's temple was built. And so the unfinished pyramid is actually a Masonic symbol. The eye of providence is actually the eye of Lucifer. I don't have time to get into that. And the rays of the sun are coming from the eyes, from the eye of providence. Now it's interesting that Henry Wallace, who was vice president under uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, suggested that the great seal be placed on a coin. But uh, Roosevelt said, no, uh, we shouldn't place it on a coin, we should place it on the one dollar bill. And by the way, Henry Wallace and uh, Franklin Roosevelt were both 32nd degree Masons, in case you didn't know that. And uh, it's interesting that from 1935 on, this um, emblem was actually placed on the one dollar bill instead of placing it on a coin. Now you'll notice another connection with Rome between this seal and what we find with the ancient Roman Empire. Have you noticed the three inscriptions on, the, uh, on this seal? You have three inscriptions and what language are they in? Why aren't they in English? This is the United States of America. They're all in Latin. You have Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means a new world order, incidentally. You thought that George Bush, the first George Bush, coined that one. No, it's on our, on our great seal. The second one is Anuit Coeptis, which means he has favored our undertaking. And the third is E Pluribus Unum, out of the many, one. Let me ask you, which empire of antiquity had Latin as its language? Rome. Also under the pyramid is the date 1776 in Roman numerals. How many of you have ever visited Washington DC? What kind of architecture do you have in Washington DC? It's Roman architecture and, it, and it's filled with monuments just like ancient Rome was filled with monuments. Many of the inscriptions on the monuments are in Latin and dates are placed with Roman numerals. Interestingly enough the upper chamber of, uh, of Congress is called the Senate and those who serve in there are called senators. Where does that come from? It comes from Rome. In fact do you know that in the, in the early history of the United States Republic uh, they didn't want to call the armed forces armies. It was distasteful to call them armies. And so early they called them legions. Do you know that originally the armies of the United States were called legions? By the way we still have the American legion that comes from this. Where did they get that terminology from? Legions, the armies of the United States. They got it from Rome. By the way, in the early constitutional period, 
of the history of the United States, many flags were made that were very interesting. In fact there was one flag that was never made, allow me to tell you first of all about that one. General Knox suggested that a flag be made with a life-sized eagle on it, and it would be called the Standard of the Legion. The flag was never made, but a few years later, in 1791, a, a flag was made which was similar to the one which General Knox suggested that should be made. The name of that flag in 1791 was the Standard of the Eagle. Now is that interesting or what? The Standard of the Eagle. Believe it or not, I have pictures of this. On this flag there is an eagle, he's facing right. He has arrows in his talons. His wings are outspread, and there is a huge sunburst above his head. There are dozens of flags in the early constitutional period of the United States that have this phenomenon. You say, well, Pastor Bohr, okay, there's this connection between the Roman standard and the great seal of the United States. What does that have to, say, have to do with the fulfillment of prophecy? Allow me to go through it as quickly as I can. There is a direct transmission of apostate religion from ancient Babylon to the United States of America today. And I want to go through that, by the way this is all documented historically. If anybody is interested in the specific documentation I can share it with you. You see, in ancient Babylon, the god that was worshipped was the sun god. His name was Marduk. In fact, the image that Nebuchadnezzar raised up was made all of gold. The ancients called gold the dew of the sun. In other words, when uh, everybody there bowed before the image of Nebuchadnezzar, they were bowing before the sun god, Marduk. Now when Babylon uh, fell on the night that Belshazzar was killed, uh, Babylon came under the leadership of Medo-Persia and there were several of the priests of Babylon who remained in Babylon, but several kings of the Persian kingdom were unhappy with this religion that Babylon had, because it was polytheistic. In other words, they believed in many gods, the Persians believed only in one good god. And so two of the kings, Darius and Xerxes, massacred these religious leaders of Babylon, and they fled, they all fled, the ones that were remaining, to the city of Pergamum in Asia Minor. Now you say, why is that significant that they, that they fled to uh, Pergamum in Asia Minor? For the simple reason that in the year 63 BC, the great Roman general Pompey led a military campaign to Asia Minor, to Pergamum. And while he was in Pergamum, he adopted the eagle as the official emblem of the Roman armies. And he also adopted the god that was worshipped there, which was the god Mithra, the sun god. But that sun god Mithra actually came from Babylon when the priests fled to Pergamum so that they would not be slaughtered. The interesting thing is, that Rome then adopted this apostate religion that was transferred from, from Babylon to Pergamum. Now the early church fathers, and when I talk about the early church fathers I'm talking about the second and third century of the Christian church, began to celebrate Sunday in honor of the resurrection. In fact they celebrated sunrise services in honor of the resurrection. Now in the fourth century a man by the name of Constantine the Great was a worshiper of Mithra. He called this god Deus Sol Invictus, which is the invincible sun. And he noticed that Christians celebrated early Sunday morning services in honor of the resurrection of their god. And he said, you know, we could kill two birds with one stone here. You know, we could have the, the Romans honor the first day of the week uh, because of their god Mithra, and we could have the Christians honor their god because he resurrected on the first day of the week, and in this way we can unite the Roman Empire. In other words, Constantine was a shrewd politician, and he saw in this, uh, in this observance of the day of the sun a way of uniting the empire. And so in the year 321 AD, Constantine gave a Sunday law, 
and in that Sunday law he said that everyone was supposed to rest on the venerable day of the sun. Now that was mainly a civil observance, but later on in the Council of Constantinople in 381 we find a definite decree given by the Emperor that Sunday was to be kept as a day of rest, religiously speaking. Now interestingly enough the day of the sun was then picked up by the Roman Catholic Papacy. It was continued throughout the Middle Ages. In fact the Bible speaks about this when it says that the little horn thought that he could change what? That he could change the times and the law. In other words it was imbibed from ancient Rome via Constantine. Via, by the way it's the church of Pergamum also in Revelation that is the transitional church spiritually speaking. And so it was transferred to the papacy and in the 16th century Protestants were born from the Catholic Church. And they felt that the, this custom of keeping the day of the sun was too entrenched in Christianity to be able to change it. There were some reformers that believed that the Sabbath was the day that you're supposed to keep. But it was so entrenched in Christianity that they believed that it would be impossible to change it. And so Protestantism continued the practice of keeping Sunday in honor of the resurrection of Christ instead of keeping the Holy Sabbath. So what I'm saying is that this practice of sun worship or worshiping on the day of the sun was transferred from Babylon to Pergamum to Rome, through Constantine to Papal Rome, and then it was transferred to Protestantism, and by the way when the Puritans came to the United States they brought this practice to the United States of America, and they actually imposed Sunday, they're known as blue laws, in colonial America because they had brought this from Europe. Now what I'm saying is that in the end time this country represented by the eagle and the sun that acquired its emblems from ancient Rome is going to repudiate its constitution and is going to impose a national Sunday law. And you say, Pastor Bohr, what you're saying is absolutely ridiculous. Well if you think it's so ridiculous I invite you to come to our next lecture. Because do you know that in 1888 in these United States of America a national Sunday law was almost enacted? Did you know that people went to jail? And people were punished for, with fines in different places of the, of the United States because they did not observe the day of the sun as the day of worship in the United States? And many of the things that happened around 1888 are happening in the Protestant world today, particularly among conservative Protestants. So don't think that this is just something wild, you know this could never happen, this is the land of the free and the home of the brave, everything is going to be fine. This has been attempted once before and it is going to be attempted once again. Now allow me to read you some interesting statements from Ellen White on this point. Are you seeing the connection between the eagle and the sun in ancient Rome and the United States in the day of the sun etc.? Notice in the book Maranatha page 179 this remarkable statement. When the land, speaking of the United States, when the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for His people, that they might worship Him according to the dictates of their own consciences, the land over which for long years the shield of no omnipotence has been spread. See this country, God has had His shield of, of omnipotence upon this country. The land which God has favored by making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ. When that land shall, through its legislators, abjure, that is abandon, the principles of Protestantism and give countenance to Romish apostasy, in tampering with God's law, it is then that the final work of the man of sin will be revealed. Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of the papacy. By a national act, what is a national act? It has to be done by whom? By Congress, that's right, by a national act enforcing the false Sabbath, see there's where you have the standard with the eagle and the sun, 
And by the way, this law will be sealed with the great seal of the United States. She says, by a national act enforcing the false Sabbath, they will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience. Then it will be time for God to work in mighty power for the vindication of His truth. In another statement, Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 451, she says this, by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness is that what happened to Israel uh, when Jerusalem was destroyed did they disconnect themselves fully from righteousness yes she continues saying when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism when under the influence of this threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near and now notice the comparison she makes as the approach of the Roman armies was a sign in the to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem so may this apostasy, she's speaking about the day, of the day of the sun, the day of worship, so may this apostasy be a sign to us that the limit of God's forbearance is reached, that the measure of our nation's iniquity is full, and that the angel of mercy is about to take her flight, never to return. You remember when Jesus left the temple, he said, your house is left unto you desolate? She says the people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress which the prophets have described as the time of Jacob's trouble. Notice that immediately after she speaks about uh, this Sunday law, the day of the sun imposed by law in the United States, following the example of Rome, where it was gotten from, she speaks about the time of trouble. Have you ever read in Matthew chapter 24, immediately after it speaks about the abomination of desolation, it says, then who, those who are in Judea, what? Flee to the mountains. Now comes the tribulation, such as never has been seen. Now I want to read one other statement, Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, pages 464 and 465. This is a very significant one. She says, the time is not far distant when like the early disciples we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. Do you see the connection that she's making here? The siege by the Roman armies represents what? It represents the moment when the United States shall enforce the papal Sabbath, which is the day of the what? The day of the sun. Then she says, it will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. And thus national apostasy will lead to national ruin. Notice last day events, page 133, she says the people of the United States have been a favored people, but when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, and give countenance to popery, that's a term that was used for the papacy in her day and age, the measure of their guilt of the United States will be full and national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. Last day events 133 and 134 she says when our nation in its legislative councils shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance and bringing an oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh day Sabbath, the law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void in our land, and national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. That's another way of saying abomination will be followed by what?
by desolation. Let me ask you, God's people who flee, which day are they going to be keeping? Pray that your flight might not be in the winter or on the what? Or on the Sabbath day. Interesting. That back then, God's people who fled were keeping the Sabbath. How about in the end time? What day are God's people going to be keeping? The Sabbath. And then like Matthew 24 describes this time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And it sa Jesus says there that if these days are not cut short, no flesh would be left alive. Allow me to read you one final statement. Great Controversy, page 614, where Ellen White describes what the world is going to be like after probation closes. She says, when he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed, and Satan has entire control of the finally impenitent. That's what happened in Jerusalem. God withdrew His presence, and Jerusalem, she says that the people became satanic. She continues saying, God's long-suffering has ended. The world has rejected His mercy, despised His love, and trampled upon His law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God, persistently res resisted, has been at last withdrawn. Unsheltered by divine grace. That's quite an expression. Unsheltered by divine grace. They have no protection from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold the, in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in a ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. Do you see how she's comparing what's going to happen at the end with what happened to Jerusalem of old? That's why, folks, we need to make a decision that we're going to obey the Lord, all of the law of the Lord, because we love Him, including the Sabbath. That's why He calls the end-time generation to worship the Creator.